The first question that we have this evening is the question, why was Jesus Christ water baptized? Let's start in Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. Mark 1, 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of of repentance for the remission of sins. Based upon Mark chapter 1 verse 4, what is the purpose of water baptism? It is to obtain the remission of sins. In other words, to obtain forgiveness of sin. Verse 5, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Get Luke 3, verse 3. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Get Acts 2, verse 38. What we're going to see here, and I'm going to show you this in several different verses, is that under the gospel of the kingdom, the purpose of water baptism is to obtain the remission of sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's do one more, Acts 22, 16. Acts 22, 16 pertains to Paul's baptism, but the person that was baptizing him was Ananias. And so what we're going to read in Acts 22, 16 is Ananias' understanding of the purpose of water baptism. Acts 22, 16. And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord." So what I'll suggest to you is that if we look carefully at what those verses say, Mark chapter 1, Luke 3, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, what is the purpose, what is the reason that someone submits to water baptism under the gospel of the kingdom? It is to obtain the forgiveness of sins, to obtain the remission of sins. So that raises the following question. Jesus Christ was water baptized. Did Jesus Christ need to be water baptized to obtain the remission of his sins? Okay, the correct answer is no. If any of you get that wrong, <laughs> go directly to jail do not pass go, do not collect $200. Obviously, Jesus Christ did not sin. Obviously, he did not need the remission of sins because he had no sin. But that leaves us with the question of why then was he water baptized? Because he clearly was. So turn with me to Numbers chapter 4. Numbers chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 3. Numbers 4 and verse 3. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle in the con of the congregation. What we're reading about in Numbers chapter 4 is some regulations that verse chapter 4 is some regulations that apply to Levitical priests that do the work of the Lord in the tabernacle of the congreg congregation. Go down with me to verse 23. So we're in Numbers chapter 4, verse 23. From 30 years old and upward until 50 years old, shalt thou number them, all that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of 
the congregation. So what I simply want you to notice from Numbers chapter 4 is at what age does someone who is a Levitical priest enter into the work in the tabernacle of the congregation? 30 years old. Get with me Exodus chapter 29, and we'll look at verse 1. So Numbers 4 pertains to the age at which someone who is a a Levitical priest enters into the the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. What we're going to read in Exodus 29 is we're going to read about the ceremony that places the priest, uh, that, that equips him to enter into the priesthood. Exodus chapter 29, verse 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. In other words, what do you do to to consecrate them, to to set them apart, to install them into the office? Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and cakes unleavened tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened anointed with oil, of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. Verse 4, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. Verse 1 spoke of what you needed to do to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. And that procedure that hallows them, what does it include? In verse 4, a washing with water. What is a baptism? It is a washing. Get with me Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the capital A apostle and capital H, capital P, high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So what Hebrews 3, verse 1 tells you is that the capital A apostle, the great high priest, is who exactly? Jesus Christ. So is Jesus Christ not only a a priest, but the great high priest? He is, right? Turn with me then to John chapter 1 and verse 29. John 1 and verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him. And said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So when John the Baptist sees Jesus Christ approaching him, John's immediate reaction is to say, Behold the Lamb. And he recognizes that Jesus Christ is going to do what? Take away the sin of the world. So does the Lord Jesus Christ come to John because he needs his sins forgiven? No, he's coming to John, and his purpose is to do what? To take away the sin of the world. Look with me at verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Let me ask you a question. You you probably recall the incident when... Mary was present with John the Baptist's mother, and both the Lord and John the Baptist were in their respective mother's wombs. Which one of those babies was older? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist was older than Jesus Christ. But if you notice what John the Baptist says in verse 30, he says, for he was before me. 
Obviously, John understands that even though John in earthly human terms is slightly older than the Lord Jesus Christ, which one of them actually is far, far older? And of course, it's Jesus Christ because he's eternal. He's existed from the very beginning. Now look at verse 31. So John 1, 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John the Baptist obviously testifies to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Get with me Matthew 3, verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. So Matthew 3.13 specifically says, the Lord Jesus Christ came to John, and he came to John for what purpose? To be baptized of him. So the Lord is intentionally going to John to be baptized. Verse 14, but John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So how does John the Baptist feel about baptizing the Lord Jesus Christ? He's hesitant to do so. The reason he's hesitant to do so, does John understand the purpose of his baptism? Yes, because he preaches the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So John understands the purpose of his baptism is to confer the remission of sins. So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to John to be water baptized, what does John naturally think? I'm not, why would I baptize you? You don't need the remission of sins. And in fact, what does John say in that verse? I have need to be baptized of thee, because John understood that Jesus Christ was the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. So John is puzzled. Why are you coming to me to be water baptized? John doesn't understand. Verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. In other words, John, go along with this. I, I want this to happen. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Doesn't say, John, do this because I need my sins washed away. It says, do this for what reason? Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. So the Lord was doing something here that was fulfilling all righteousness. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So here's what happens. The Lord Jesus Christ goes to John to be water baptized. John resists at first. The Lord says, suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness. When the Lord is baptized, what does God the Father do in response? Well, there's a voice from heaven. The Holy Ghost, like a dove, descends upon him. And what does the God the Father say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, it is the Father's declaration, not that the Son needed to have his sins washed away or, or, or was in need of any sort of remission, but that God the Father was already pleased with him. That's what's going on in 
in, in that chapter, the Lord's making it absolutely clear that this was not a typical baptism. Get with me Luke 3, verse 21. Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. Luke 3, 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying that heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased." And so again, very clear that God the Father is well pleased with the Lord Jesus Christ. Very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ does not need water baptism for the remission of sins. So we're left with, okay, what's going on here then? Because the Lord clearly doesn't need to have his sins forgiven. Read the very next verse. Again, this is a cheat code. This is an advanced maneuver. Don't try this at home. Don't try this without adult supervision. But it is always a good idea to read the next verse and read the context. Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. That's probably an irrelevant detail. Holy Spirit probably included that for no particular reason. Being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Do you see what's going on? What's going on is simply this. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he goes to John to be water baptized, has nothing to do with remission of sins because he doesn't need remission of sins. But what did we read about in Numbers chapter 4? What does a priest have to do in order to properly enter in to the service of the tabernacle, into the work that's performed in the tabernacle of the congregation. They have to be baptized, don't they? That's what, number, that's what Numbers 4 says. At 30 years of age, the priest enters into the tabernacle of the congregation to do work. Exodus 29 says, to hallow someone into the priest's office, they have to be washed with water, and that occurs at 30 years of age, and Hebrews 3, 1 says that Jesus Christ was the great what? High priest. Well, if he's the great high priest, do you think that he fulfilled the Old Testament law or that he ignored it? He fulfilled it. He, did, he wasn't water baptized to wash away his sins. He was water baptized so that he could be properly fulfilled. When, when, when the Lord said to John the Baptist, suffer it to be so to fulfill all righteousness, it wasn't to, to wash away his sins. It was to fulfill the righteousness of complying with the Old Testament regulations to properly make him a high priest. That's what's going on. It's the Lord's attention to all the details of the Old Testament law that he was in perfect compliance with. So that's why the Lord was baptized. It has nothing, obviously nothing to do with his sins being washed away, but it's just yet another confirmation that he fulfilled all the requirements of the law and, and was duly installed as the great high priest. Next question. This, this next question is a great one, and we're going to spend some time on this. What is the bare minimum someone has to know and understand to be saved? Do they have to understand the resurrection and what day Jesus rose? Or can someone just believe that Jesus died for their sins without knowing or understanding the resurrection? Is it necessary to believe in the virgin birth? In other words, what is the bare minimum of what one has to believe to be saved? Great question. We're going to spend some time on this. First, go to Romans 1.16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
So if I were to ask you the question, scripturally, what is the power of God unto salvation? What's the proper answer? The gospel of Christ, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. So what is the power of God unto salvation? It's the gospel of Christ. So the answer to the question, what is the bare minimum someone has to know and understand to be saved? It's going to be the gospel of Christ. So now let's spend a little time and understand exactly what the gospel of Christ includes. And I'm going to give you three points that I think are required. So the first point, get 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. I, I believe there are really three key elements of the gospel of Christ, three key things to understand. The first one is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And the gospel, of course, means good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The first element, the first component of the gospel of Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ's death for sin, burial, and resurrection. Get with me Romans 3.25. Romans chapter 3. Verse 25. <clears throat> Romans 3, 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, notice this, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So Romans 3.25 refers to faith in His blood. I believe that is equivalent. That's, that's the same thing as belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Faith in His blood. Get Romans 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, and we'll look at verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So let me ask you a question. Is it sufficient to believe that Christ died on the cross and not believe in the resurrection, or do you have to believe both that Christ died on the cross and resurrected? You have to believe both, right? Let's just read verse 9 again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So what I'm going to suggest to you is the first component of the gospel of Christ is you need to believe the Lord Jesus Christ's death for sin, faith in His blood, His burial, and His resurrection. If you don't believe in the resurrection, it's insufficient on the authority of Romans 10 verse 9, as well as the authority of 1 Corinthians 15. Now the second point, the second aspect of the gospel of Christ is this. The Lord Jesus Christ is both fully man and fully God. I, I think you need to believe that in order to be saved. Why do I say that? Get Acts 16, verse 30. Acts 16, verse 30. Now, in, in Acts 16, we're reading the account of when Paul and Silas are in a jail in Philippi, the, the Philippian jailer asked the famous question in Acts 16, 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
Absolutely the most important question during the dispensation of grace. No, there's nothing that's even close. Now notice verse 31. And they said, believe on. The idea here is reliance upon. Believe on, notice what it says here, the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. In order to be saved today, because the question in verse 30 was, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has many different names in the scriptures. He's called Jesus of Nazareth. He's called the Son of God. He's called the Son of Man. He's called the Christ. He's called the Messiah. There's a bunch of different names. All of those names are meaningful. In, in other words, they have a specific meaning to them. Acts 16.31 uses the name, The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that name, Lord Jesus Christ, includes both the concept that Jesus Christ was a man and fully man, and also the concept that he was God and fully God. Why do I say that? Get with me Matthew 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. Matthew 1, Matthew 1 and verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. When it refers to Mary bringing forth a son, that's a reference to her having a human baby. She's going to have a child. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus was the name given to the baby that Mary bore. For he shall save his people from their sins. Get with me Luke chapter 1, verse 31. In Scripture, Jesus Christ is sometimes referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, and that is a reference to him being understood to be a man. Luke 1, verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So based upon those verses, the name Jesus is a reference to the Lord taking on human flesh and being a man. So when Acts 16, 31 says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the title, the Lord Jesus Christ, includes the idea, includes the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was a man. Get with me John 20, verse 31. John chapter 20, and we'll look at verse 31. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, comma, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Do you notice how that verse references the Christ, comma, the Son of God. That's telling you that the term Christ means the Son of God. That's what Christ means. Look with me at Matthew 26, 63. So, for example, in the Scriptures, when the question is posed, Art thou the Christ? What it's asking is, are you the 
Son of God. Look with me at Matthew 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Is Pilate asking Jesus if he's a man? No, he's asking him if he is the Christ, and what does Christ mean? The Son of God. Get with me Romans chapter 1. So what I'm suggesting to you is in, in Acts 16, 30 and 31, when the Philippian jailer asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And, the, and Paul answers by saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, the, it is believing on him, not only that he was a man, but that he was the Son of God. He was both. <clears throat> Look with me at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. And the term the gospel of God is a gospel that both Peter and Paul preach. You can see both of them preach the content of the gospel of God. <clears throat> Verse 2 which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Well, doesn't verse 2 tells you, tell you that the gospel of God is not a mystery gospel? When it says, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So it's clearly a prophesied gospel. Verse 3, <clears throat> concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. Well, verse 3 is very clearly saying that he's a man, right? Because he's of the seed of David. In other words, David was his ancestor. And then it specifically says, according to the flesh. So doesn't verse 3 indicate very clearly that Jesus Christ was a man, that according to the flesh he was of the seed of David? Notice verse 4. And, so not only verse 3, and declared to be the capital S Son of capital G God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So verse 4 is very clear that Jesus Christ was declared to be the capital S Son of capital G God, that He's God. And that was proven by the resurrection from the dead. So point number two is simply this. Part of what you are required to believe to be saved is that the Lord Jesus Christ is both man, fully man, and God, fully God. Point number three, belief in the gospel is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ's death as sufficient. It is not simply intellectual knowledge of the historical fact of his death on the cross. It also requires trust in the Lord's death and not one's own works. So I'm going to read three again because there was a lot in there. Belief in the gospel is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ's death as sufficient. In other words, it's relying upon his death alone, not his death plus my righteousness not his death plus my good works. It's relying exclusively, solely on the merits of his death for sin. It is not simply intellectual knowledge of the historical fact of his death on the cross. There's billions of people that know the historical fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross because it's simply a fact of history. He did. And he died on the cross for man's sins. Lots of people are aware. They have knowledge of that fact. But do they trust his death for the payment of their sins? There are all kinds, and I'm sorry to say this, there's all kinds of church people 
that know that Christ died on the cross. But if you ask them the question, if you were to die tonight and God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? They will then tell you something that's part of their resume. I've been water baptized. I already have a church. I do good works. I'm basically a good person. Are they actually trusting in the Lord's death? They're not. If what they're saying is the reason you should let me in, God, is because I've been water baptized and I tithe and I'm a church member and I give to charity and I'm a kind person. Well, then you're trusting in your own righteousness. Look with me at Ephesians 1.13. And the point I'm trying to make is that faith that saves you is not simply awareness of the historical fact of Christ's death. It's the fact that you trust it for the payment of your sins. Look with me at Ephesians 1.13. And this verse is so helpful. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And I'm going to suggest to you in that verse that trusted and believed are used interchangeably. What saves you is not simply knowing that Christ died on the cross for man's sin. That's just a fact. That's that's no more than believing, you know, a circle has 360 degrees. It's simply a fact. What saves you is when you trust that. Let me give you an example of why this is so important. Think of the simple two verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So true faith in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is going to exclude what? Boasting. But when you ask people, if you were to die tonight and God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What are the common answers? I have been water baptized. I already have a church. I tithe. I give to the poor. I keep the commandments. I live by the Sermon on the Mount. None of those things are actually trust in the gospel. What you're trusting in is your own righteousness. And what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 specifically says is to exclude boasting, lest any man should boast. Let me make one more point on the subject. <clears throat> when Jesus Christ died on the cross for man's sin, he died for every single sin you ever committed. The the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands, right? I mean, think of this. Think of all the unkind things you've ever said. Think of all the evil things you regret. Think of all the, not a one of us would stand up and publicly say, here's everything I thought about the last week. You wouldn't do it. Christ died for all of that. And he'll give you salvation as a free gift. But what he will not do is he will not save you in your self-justification. Do you realize how absurd it is for a sinner that has hundreds of thousands of sins to think, well, Christ died for my sins and that plus my water baptism saves me. Or that plus my living a good life saves me. Do you see how insulting that is to the immense sacrifice that Christ made? And that's why it is critical to understand that belief in the Scripture, faith in the Scripture is trusting. It's trusting that Christ shed blood on the cross is sufficient And there is nothing else for you to do but trust in that. I hope I'm wrong. I honestly fear that there will be many churched people 
that are unsaved because they didn't trust alone in what Christ did for them. And they are boasting, which Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says is not how grace works. Look with me at Romans 4, verse 5. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if I believe Christ died for my sins and I'm trying to work for my salvation, what happens? I don't have faith that God counts for righteousness. Because what does it say? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. That's not teaching against good works. Ephesians 2.10 says we're created unto good works. As a saved person, you should do good works. But should you trust your good works in any way, shape, fashion, or form for your salvation? You should not. Because God justifies only those who believe in him and do not work for their own righteousness. Look at Romans 11, verse 6. Romans 11, verse 6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. And so what Romans 11, 6 does is it, pre it, it presents only two options. You can be saved 100% by works or 100% by grace. Can any sinful creature on the earth be saved 100% by works? It's, it's, it's just simply ludicrous. You can be saved 100% by grace, and that's the only way to be saved. What man would like to do, because man is self-righteous and boasts, is he would like to be saved 90% by grace and 10% by his goodness his turning over a new leaf, his making Christ the Lord of his life, etc. Because then what would he have the ability to do? He have the ability to boast. And scripture excludes that. So let me tie this all together. What is the bare minimum that someone needs to believe to be saved? It seems to me it's the following. You have to believe the Lord Jesus Christ's death for sin, his burial and resurrection. You have to have faith in what he did in dying for your sins. You also have to have faith that he rose from the dead. Secondly, you have to believe that he's both man and the son of God. If he wasn't the son of God, he couldn't pay for your sins, right? But he was also man. He took upon his, himself human flesh so that he could die for our sins. So he was both. He was both man and the son of God. And then third... Belief in the gospel is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ's death as sufficient. It is not simply intellectual knowledge of the historical fact of his death. It requires trust in the Lord's death and not one's works. Because God won't save you in your boasting. He won't save you in your self-righteousness. Now, one of the follow-up questions that the person asked was, is it necessary to believe the virgin birth as part of the gospel? So let's think through this. When you present the gospel, do you typically spend time mentioning the virgin birth? And, and the answer typically is you don't. Because when, when you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and it tells us about the gospel, what events does it mention? It mentions the Lord's death for sin, burial, and resurrection. So typically, you wouldn't mention the virgin birth in a gospel presentation. So, do you need to believe in the virgin birth to be saved? I don't think you need to believe it in the sense of you have to be thinking about it when you believe the gospel. However, if someone hearing the gospel, so they're hearing a gospel presentation, and they deny the virgin birth, what they are doing is they are denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and do not have saving faith. So in other words, if you make a gospel presentation to someone and you don't mention the virgin birth, 
and they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and was given the third day, and, and they believe all the things we talked about, the three points. If they believe that, even though they're not focusing on the virgin birth, they're saved. But if you make a gospel presentation, and they think to themselves, I don't believe the virgin birth, then they do not have saving faith. And so let me prove that to you. So get with me, John 8, verse 23. Now I'm going back to the Gospels here, and this is during the Lord's earthly ministry, but I think these verses are helpful for, for what we're looking at. So John 8, verse 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. What the Lord is saying there, obviously, is he's saying he's the son of God. He's not of this world. He's from above. Now, notice verse 24. I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And the point that he's making there is, is simply this. This is true uh, under the pro prophetic program. It's true during the dispensation of grace. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's what he's saying. If you don't believe he's the Son of God, then what's going to happen? You're going to die in your sins. Simple as that. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you will die in your sins. Look with me at Genesis 5 and verse 3. Genesis chapter 5, and we'll look at verse 3. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. What Genesis 5, 3 teaches is that all men born from Adam, whose likeness do they bear? They bear Adam's likeness, don't they? And if they bear Adam's likeness, let's look at what that means. Get Romans 5, verse 19. Every child that is born on this earth bears Adam's likeness. What that means then, Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, who's that? That's Adam. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By Adam's disobedience, how much of humanity was made sinners? All of it. Look with me at Psalm 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, <clears throat> Psalm 51, and we'll look at verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And, and the I here is David, by the way. David is the author of Psalm 51. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In the natural state of human affairs, all children are begotten in Adam's image, conceived in sin, and born with a sin nature. Now, when you hold a little baby, are they cute and are they relatively innocent? They are. But does every single one of them have a sin nature? And the answer is yes, they do, because they are, they are made in Adam's likeness. And by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, Romans 5, 19. Get with me Matthew 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1, and look at verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, 
is God with us? So Matthew 1, 23 makes clear that a virgin shall be with child. This was not a natural human conception. And the name of this child will mean Emmanuel, which is God with us. Look with me at Luke 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Well, very clear in Luke 135 that the Holy Ghost came upon the Virgin Mary and generated, quote, that holy thing, which is the Son of God. In other words, it's obviously not the typical human baby. So let's tie this together. If someone <clears throat> denies the virgin birth, then here's what they're saying. They're saying that the Lord was not conceived by the Holy Spirit. If the Lord wasn't conceived by the Holy Spirit, then he can't be that holy thing, right? Because he would just be a normal child. And he would not be the Son of God, based upon Luke 135. Instead, if you deny the virgin birth, you're saying that the Lord was conceived by natural means, which means he had a human father, which means he would have been a sinner, which means he wouldn't have been holy, and he would not be the Son of God. So if someone denies the virgin birth, what are they denying? They're denying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what will you do? Ye shall die in your sins. So in most gospel presentations, people don't mention the virgin birth. They typically will say that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And if you're saying He's the Son of God, you are saying that He was born of a virgin because that's the only way He could have been the Son of God. If He was born by natural means, He would have been a sinner. He wouldn't have been that holy thing. He wouldn't have been properly called the Son of God. Let's look at two more things. There are two things that people sometimes think are necessary to believe for salvation, but they're really not. So get Romans 1.16. We'll go back to where we started. Some folks will say, well, you can't get saved without a King James Bible. Now, I'm... I'm Pro King James, this is pretty obvious. But read Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So what is the power of God unto salvation? It's the gospel of Christ. You can communicate the gospel of Christ using different words than the KJV. I don't recommend doing that, but can you? If I say the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and deceased on the cross for our sins, KJV doesn't say that. But is that the content of what it says? It is. So it, it's not the case that you have to believe the authority of the KJV to be saved. It would be good to do, but it's not required. The question was, what is the bare minimum? The second thing people sometimes wonder is, can you be saved without the knowledge of the mysteries? Get Romans 11.25. Romans 11.25. <clears throat> For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. What is the largest denomination mentioned in the scriptures? The ignorant brethren. The ignorant brethren. And they're quite numerous. It doesn't say the ignorant lost people, though, does it? It says the ignorant brethren, which means they're what? Brethren. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. If you think about when you were saved, how much did you understand when you were saved? Well, 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that truth is discerned by the Holy Spirit, right? So as a lost man, how much did you actually understand of spiritual truth? Nothing. So the moment you got saved, you know how much you understood? Not very much. You understood that you were a sinner. You understood that Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the third day. You, had, you need to understand his death, burial, and resurrection. You need to understand that you're saved by his grace, not by works. But, you know, did you understand premillennialism? Did you understand the pre-tribulational nature of the rapture? Were you an expert on Paul's apostleship when you got saved? My point is don't, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Okay, don't make it more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, the, the things that you need to know are the three things that we talked about uh, earlier. I can see we are close to time, so we will, uh, let me close us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to meet with the saints and study the scriptures. We thank you for the, the ability with technology to fellowship with folks both near and far. We pray, Lord, that your word would accomplish its purpose of building faith in us. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.